Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to the Harvard Blockchain Club for uh, inviting me to, to speak about on-chain intelligence and, uh, and what we're building at Arkham. Uh, so I'm Miguel. I'm the CEO of Arkham Intelligence, where we do uh, crypto data intelligence software for the world. So today, I'm going to be talking about finding alpha and managing your risk with blockchain data. So generally speaking, when people talk about trading any kind of asset, and this would include traditional asset classes like stocks, um, but also cryptocurrency, they generally break down their style of trading into uh, two different kinds. Uh, the first is asset fundamentals. Um, so this would be sort of investing or trading a particular asset uh, based on things such as, you know, how good the product is, traction, balance sheet data, um, the executive team, central bank policy, macro, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, and this is kind of like the more sort of Warren Buffett style of investing. Uh, and then the second uh, sort of paradigm for trading is uh, trading based on price data or what people tend to describe as technicals. Um, so this would be sort of the more technical analysis style of trading. If you're very familiar with all the screenshots on Twitter of people trading based on green and red bars and sort of what their patterns look like. Uh, this is essentially the paradigm of trading based on uh, previous pricing trends and then the actions uh, that happened in the market uh, after those price trends. So, you know, based on a particular pattern, which people will generally describe in terms of, you know, bull flags or bear flags or bull pendants, bear pendants, um, you can then sort of analyze this and then try to predict, okay, based on this similar price structure in the past, what occurred immediately after, perhaps this is going to be something, you know, very similar. Maybe this will be a similar situation. Uh, and this is where people tend to talk about the patterns themselves, the support levels, uh, regression analysis, and the broader kind of technical analysis sphere. Now, the interesting thing is that there's actually a third paradigm of trading, which is also very important. Uh, and that's actually transaction data. Uh, and so with transaction data, typically speaking, this is where you actually get to see things like uh, entity positions, uh, new entrants into the market, large transactions, insider activity, and sort of what we describe as entity history. Uh, and so transaction data is where you actually analyze who are the players who are investing or trading your particular asset class. So if you are investing or trading a particular token, uh, it's very important to know who are the people who are buying this token and what size, who are the people who are selling this token and what size, uh, what kind of impact is that likely to make on the order book uh, and therefore on the price itself. Um, so this kind of transaction level data uh, is actually incredibly important and much more insightful than something like looking at previous chart patterns for you know, what we're likely to, to see in the future for uh, price movements of a particular token. Now, the interesting thing is that in traditional trading, so in sort of the more uh, 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 older kind of asset classes like equities, this data tends to be guarded by brokers, exchanges, and regulators. Um, so this is, for example, where then uh, organizations like the SEC regulators come in and then start to dictate what kind of transaction level data must be broadcast to the public, right? So this would be things such as, for example, a 13F form. Um, so this is where websites such as like Whale Wisdom uh, come in where people will frequently try to look up, okay, what large hedge funds are, you know, buying very large positions and in what companies are they buying those positions in? Um, so this is, for example, if a large sort of investment firm takes a position of greater than $100 million in a particular stock, they have to file within you know, a certain amount of time, I believe 90 days, uh, to the SEC, which then releases the information publicly that now they hold that position. I think there's sort of similar requirements for you know, equities where if somebody purchases more than 10% of a particular stock, it may even be lower for certain equities like 5%, um, then they're also required to submit this to the public so that the public is aware of this information and can then price it in and trade accordingly. The interesting thing about crypto is that in crypto, all of this transaction level data is discoverable without necessarily the person needing to make some kind of public filing to a regulator. But the interesting problem is that it takes time and effort to actually make this transaction level data or this on-chain data actually useful. Uh, and so all of this information that exists on-chain, uh, number one, uh, is kind of all pseudonymous. So you don't necessarily know who the different addresses uh, belong to and who are all of the people who are moving around these different asset classes are. 
Uh, the data can be, you know, quite difficult to use if you're not technical. So any normal person sort of interfacing with blockchain data directly will have a pretty difficult time actually making use and making sense of that uh, information. Uh, there tends to not be very much sort of aggregation. Everything is sort of on an address by address level on, on the blockchain itself. Uh, and so you can't sort of piece together, okay, these two addresses all actually belong to the same person um, and treat it as such. So it can be quite difficult to, to actually use. Now, crypto intelligence technology and what we're building at Arkham actually solves this problem. Uh, and so in terms of what we actually do, we start with opaque blockchain data. So we start with on-chain information and also off-chain information about all of these different addresses and crypto tokens. We start with the pseudonymous addresses themselves, a bunch of kind of raw data that can be really difficult to search. And then we run it through all of our sort of data science and R&D processes uh, in order to then try to make sense of that information and then actually make it useful and actionable. And this we can break down into two, two kind of key uh, compartments. The first is what we describe as entity classification. So this would be once you actually know a particular address belongs to a given individual or institution, how do you then find all of the other addresses that they own based on their on-chain uh, sort of signature? The second piece is then additional sort of public and metadata collection, and then the aggregation of all of those labels, which we then attach to the entities themselves. And then the last piece is using machine learning heuristics to actually go about the de-anonymization process. So based on the information of, you know, these three addresses belong to one person, these five addresses belong to one institution, and then based on the labels that we have, how can we then use machine learning techniques to try to figure out, okay, this label is appropriate for this particular entity. These are uh, the wallets that are owned by this particular institution. And sort of the end result then is one platform where you can see all of these de-anonymized users in a queryable entity database that has an API which you can use directly. So let's look at some example use cases of how one could use the Arkham platform. In this particular case, we'll be talking about Celsius Network, which was a famous, now infamous, kind of uh, so-called crypto bank. Um, so what does Celsius look like on chain? How do we actually analyze Celsius data to try to extract information um, about, you know, either hidden alpha or managing our risks. Well, the on-chain structure of Celsius data is, as you can see here. So you start out with your user wallet. So this would be your MetaMask or your Ledger or Trezor, your sort of cold storage. Then you move the money to your user-specific wallet. So this would be, for example, like your deposit address. So Celsius will then tell you, okay, if you want to deposit funds, here is where you can deposit them to. Use this wallet, which is uniquely attributed to you. Once you send the funds here, we will credit that to your account. On chain, once they actually hit that user-specific wallet, it then gets moved into a Celsius pooled wallet. So this would be sort of what people describe as a hot wallet for a particular exchange. Once it's in the pooled wallet, it then goes to deployment wallets or withdraw wallets. If it hits a withdraw wallet, it's meant to go back to the original user wallet. So if you told Celsius, well, I would like to withdraw my money now, you give them an address, the money moves from a pulled wallet to a withdraw wallet, and then from the withdraw wallet, it then goes to the user wallet. If it's in a deployment wallet, that's when it then goes to other counterparties or protocols, for example, if they were lending. How can you use this information to then unlock alpha as a sell token trader? Well, one of the things that you could have done was recognize that Celsius, um, as it appears on chain, is sus suspected of actually having purchased a significant amount of sell on exchanges. So what this means is that there was a token, sort of if you actually go through the mechanics of this trade, one of the things you want to understand is, okay, what are some of the things that actually makes tokens go up in price? Well, the number one thing, surprise, surprise, that makes tokens go up in price is that people are buying them and they buy them in very large size. So had you been looking at the on-chain signatures of the addresses that were suspected to belong to Celsius at the time, you could have seen that there were very much sort of recurring large flows onto exchanges of Celsius purchasing the sell token themselves to the tune of, at least on liquid, $127 million and on FTX, 226 million. That's a lot of sort of purchasing flows, long flows, 
um, that you can use to then say, okay, well, so long as this pattern continues, where there's a significant amount of inflow in order to purchase this token, I'm going to remain long and kind of ride that momentum as well because all of that purchasing power is going to move the market in an upward direction. If necessarily you don't think that, you know, all of these flows will move it substantially against the USD, you can then, for example, take a similar token, say in the DeFi ecosystem, that, you know, is roughly kind of following the market. You could then say, okay, well, perhaps I will go short this token, but long sell, because I know at least Celsius is going to relatively outperform this other very similar token to it because it has hundreds of millions of dollars worth of longs that don't exist in this other token. So that's one way in which you could have made money during the huge kind of roar of the Celsius token going up to the single digit dollars. Now, what does this look like as a Celsius network depositor? Where now we know in hindsight, it would have been very smart to try and manage your risk with the protocol. Well, what it looks like is you can look at the on-chain signatures for the wallets suspected of being owned by Celsius. And then once you do that, you can look at the different sort of hacks that then cause them to lose money, as well as some of the DeFi losses. So we have some examples up on the screen of losses that occurred based on you know, DeFi trading in November 2020, February 2021, over $50 million of, uh, of liquidations that happened on these protocols. And additionally, the different hacks that then caused over a hundred million in losses. So, you know, as a depositor on this particular service, you would then be able to manage your risk and say, well, you know, perhaps this isn't the kind of thing that I want to be investing my money in, seeing as, you know, there's nine figs worth of losses occurring that I, you know, I can view on chain. Based on this information, I'm going to try to manage my risk, maybe deposit elsewhere. The yield might not be worth it. And this is on top of other kind of systematic uh, issues that you know appear to have occurred, um, that which you can read more in depth uh, in our Celsius report regarding sort of asset mis mismatching uh, and, and time mismatching that actually occurred within the network. Thank you very much.